everybody. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are tuning in from. And if you are here live, do let us know. Send a comment in the chat box and we can see you and you can join in the conversation as well. Say hello. I know that there are people watching. I can see it here. <laughs> so if you are here, just let us know and let us know if you can hear us okay. All the sound stuff is all working well. You can see me, you can hear me. All right. This is episode 22, which I'm super excited about. Now, we are living in uncertain times, right? And when times are uncertain, when life throws us unexpected hurdles, the natural response is to go into survival mode, right? But the thing is, when we are in survival mode, we overfocus on perceived threats. We get distracted, we get reactive, and we don't think clearly, and we are certainly less creative. But it's during times of stress when we need our creative muscles the most and we need creativity to solve problems. One surefire way of creating uh, creativity, more creativity in our lives and cultivating creativity is by doing more of what lights you up, engaging in pursuits that you are passionate about. So important. In this episode, we're going to be talking about pursuing our passions and building a life full of creative possibilities. My name is Crystal Diaz. I'm a singer, coach, and co-founder of the Online Vocal Academy, where we help singers who don't like the way that they sound discover and cultivate the natural resonance and power of their voices. To discover how you can find your true voice for singing popular music, you can get instant access to my brand new class for free at 3singingsecrets.com. That's T-H-R-E-E, singingsecrets.com. My guest expert today is someone who has created <clears throat> a successful life doing what he is passionate about. And it's not just one thing either. Kyle Haynes is a trumpet player. He's a teacher, a private tutor, a hockey player, lead singer and second guitarist for an original alternative rock band called Other Theories. Oh, and to top it all off, he's also co-founder of a very popular live music venue located in one of the busiest districts in Hong Kong called The Aftermath. A very warm welcome to my 22nd guest, Kyle Haynes. Hey there, Kyle. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. Yeah, hi, Crystal. Thanks all for the things, me on. all the things. Yeah, no, it's great. We were just chatting just before we went live about how we met. And even though the both both of us were are in music, um, we didn't actually meet through music. And <laughs> actually, <laughs> how we met was through my husband who plays hockey yeah your right? wonderful husband That's right. <laughs> and, and tell us wait just just so i actually don't know the answer to this and i was thinking about this why yeah. were you involved in hockey again are you actually running the league like what was that <laughs> um yeah well i i started playing hockey inline hockey as soon as i came to hong kong um i used to play field hockey in the uk and that was a natural way to sort of meet people um so i met a couple of guys who then we're running the league at the time and eventually yeah we were playing at the the ymca in jordan in hong kong uh and the ymca stopped running the league on their own I they see. said hey if you guys want to run the league do so and there was a lot of squabbling and and uh people not really wanting to commit so i said okay i just i'll do it and booked the times and ran the league for a few years but that's one way to, to not enjoy playing. Just, uh, it's yeah. true. It's so true. It's one way to, it's by organizing it, right? Turning it into something that like is a responsibility as opposed to an enjoyment, right? But it's really interesting that you bring that up though, because it, it is true that sometimes connections and, you know, you meet people through ways that um, you wouldn't expect. And I'm actually reading this book right now called Conscious Luck. And they talk about taking bold action. And sometimes you have to trust your intuition and take bold action because then you never know who you might meet or you might, and that might lead to something else that is actually totally in line with, um, with your creative pursuits, which is amazing. Um, I'd love to know, were you always a multi-passionate person or was, were you, when you were younger, was it like, I want to be an astronaut? Was there one thing that you wanted to be? Or did you always like, I want to do everything. I want to do it all. <laughs> well, I, I think growing up, you see different sort of figures in the community and you perhaps want to emulate them. So I, my, my youngest memory of any sort of occupation desire was to be a teacher. Oh. Um, but maybe that stemmed from uh, from getting on with, with teachers uh, that I had. Uh, uh, my sister, uh, who I'll speak about more, a great 
great source of inspiration for me. She's a, a now ballet teacher, so she's always had this one sort of driving passion for ballet. So I think I, I felt that I needed to uh, become specific in my my interests. Um, so at a pretty young age, I started playing uh, hockey. Um, so growing up in, a, in in Britain, where everyone's into football, I wasn't particularly wasn't from a footballing family. I had no real skill at the game, and so I enjoyed sort of finding my feet in a different sport that was uh, slightly more unusual, and I could become sort of better at that quicker. I guess. And were your parents <laughs> very supportive of that? And like you know, go for what you're passionate about, or did you come from an environment where it was encouraged to you know get a like a you know real job or whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, they're, they're very supportive of everything I've done. Um, they were you know they were very keen for me to to, to learn a musical instrument. Um, both my parents uh, singing choirs or sang in choirs. Um, oh. Very musical. My mum played the flute. Um, my dad's played different types of recorders. Um, so my sister started playing the piano, and I didn't really get into to, to the classical music perhaps in the same way um, as the rest of my family I sort of felt slightly outside of that uh, sort of classical uh, education in terms of music I guess. So what music were your biggest influences growing up? Um, I, I sort of thinking back to primary school I remember getting a cassette which was Jive Bunny and the Master Mixes do you remember that? I don't know if you ever. I remember cassettes. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not familiar with Jive Bunny. So yeah, I will have to Google was, that. <laughs> it was sort of like classic rock and roll and, and okay, and rock, got punk it. Stuff that was sort of reimagined and remixed. Um, my uh, queen was was big when I was a kid, so oh, I had a that. friend's friend's mum who was a massive fan. So I got loads of cassettes from him. You know, I was constantly copying music. So. Definitely growing up, Queen was my biggest influence. That's yeah. amazing. What was it specifically about Queen? I'm just curious. I mean, I love I love that. I love Queen as well. But what, what is it that drew you away from classical music? At your whole, <laughs> like your family is in, immersed in classical. Your sister is in ballet. Right? And you're all like, I'm going to go this way. You know, what do you think was, was about that that really drew you? Was it a feeling or? That, yeah, that sort of the freedom, the performance of, of rock and roll, um, just being able to sort of do anything, the, the, the different passions. So it's a, it's a great variety. I mean, you get the same thing in classical, but as a kid, I didn't appreciate classical music in the way that I do now. Um, so Queen was much more accessible in terms of that, with just, especially with the lyrics as well. Absolutely. Um, so sort of guitar solos, the, the, the just the, the variety. All the voices. There. Yeah, harmonizing, you know, yeah. amazing stuff. Yeah. You know, I think for somebody like who is naturally inclined to be very multi-passionate, I can tell, you know, that makes sense, right? To be drawn to music that also embodies that freedom that, you know, you can't really put that that music in a box like, oh, this is all that is. And there's a lot, of, it opens the doors for a lot of creativity and opportunities that way. And I'd love to know what brought you from there to Hong Kong? Because you grew up in the UK. When, when did you get to Hong Kong again? What year was that? It was 2002. I think you said that before, right? Yeah, 2002. So it's it's and almost half my life now. Um, my goodness, this is your home, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, so uh, I finished university. I did a degree in economics, econometrics. Very boring, oh, so. wow. Okay. Um, Went that way. <laughs> I've been doing work with some uh, financial intermediaries in London during my summer, summer breaks and things like that. And I went for an interview after I graduated. And the guy sort of looked at me and said, you look too young to sell uh, investments to people. Because um, wow. I've, I've always looked fairly youthful. But when I was sort of 21 years old, I was uh, looking rather young. So this was in the this is in the UK. So you were interviewing for jobs. In the UK, yeah. So I after said to, graduating, I said to this guy, I didn't know where I wanted to start anyway. I wanted to go and see my sister because she'd moved out to Hong Kong. Oh, your uh, sister was two, here two years earlier, and because I was at university, I hadn't really had the time to visit her. Um, so yeah, I mean, as I said before, she's a ballet teacher. Went to the Royal Ballet School, and she could pretty much work anywhere. She lived in Cyprus for three years, and then moved to Hong Kong for somewhere a bit more exciting. So uh, yeah. I, 
didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in terms of work. I just decided to come to, to Asia, to Hong Kong, essentially, or Asia for three months, four months from September to Christmas um, and spend time with my sister and, and see what happened. And then uh, flash forward. So yeah, many... I, mean, <laughs> I, I arrived and I knew somewhere I wanted to stay. So it was then a question of trying to get a job and not really being qualified particularly to do much. Again, having this uh, underlying passion of teaching that I'd had since a, a young boy. So, yeah, I got into that and worked uh, in a sort of tutorial center that prepared kids to go to boarding school. So it's really good teaching. And I did that for 14 and a half years. A long time. So it's interesting that the first job you interviewed at after college, right, is you know, back in the UK was um, somebody said, you look too young. And so with the, the conversation just ended there is like, go grow up for a few more years and yeah, then come back. Come, like, back <laughs> come back in six months. What do you expect after six months? <laughs> but this is what I'm saying though, is that these things that seem like they're closed door opportunities, right? And then actually yeah. in a way that's a blessing because if they, if they had offered you, if you hadn't looked so young, you know, like, <laughs> they'd offered you a position, then you may not actually have had this particular path in your life, right? So there's that's always right. that opportunities and you have to think, that's where the creativity is so important. And that allows us to be aware of other things that we might not become a, realize, right? And thankfully, you're, and your mm. sister was here. So you're like, okay, I'll just follow this path and see, you know, I love that. I love that. So yeah. I'd love to know while you're here, when you got, you got to Hong Kong and you started t tutoring, and then one thing led yeah. to another, how did you get into the music scene though? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I started playing guitar when I was 14 or something. I didn't really form any bands back in the UK at all. Um, and so when I came to Hong Kong, I was definitely playing acoustic stuff in my room, but I wasn't really getting out into the scene or anything like that. Um, and I didn't initially meet anyone who, who took me into that scene. I didn't have connections which brought me out and about. But I ended up working uh, with a guy called Sean Martin, who's uh, from a band called the David Bowie Knives. Um, the David Bowie Knives. Yeah, fantastic. Can you can you make can you create band names out of other people's names? Is that even like commercially <laughs> allowed? <laughs> they, they get in a little bit of trouble sometimes. Uh, but uh, that's a little that's a little misleading, you know, like headlining the nice. David Bowie Knives. So they they have shortened it to the DBK now to avoid oh, confusion. I see. I see. Uh, but he he said, "Hey, clever, come clever on, my, my band is playing this gig in uh, Granville Circuit." come and see us play. So I was like, sure. So I went down with my girlfriend into this, this, this sort of narrow, I don't know if you remember, don't know Granville Circuit in Chim Chai Choi. No. Um, and they were sort of just playing on the street there. And it was, oh, wow. it was great. And then I went to see him at the Wanch and I went to more and more underground shows. I met Chris B um, and saw this sort of scene that was there. Gradually met more and more people, got invited to more gigs. Um, but I still didn't really have, from my immediate friends, I didn't really have anyone who was necessarily going with me. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I was sometimes a bit of a Billy No Mates turning up. And, uh, but how did you get in? Stuff. How did you, because I know you started Other Theories. So tell me about that. Like, what, how did you get that launched? Other Theories is your alternative rock band. Is that yeah. right? And you play original so, songs? So I been writing music and my friends are like, go on, you got to perform, you got to form a band. Uh, so I ended up forming a band with uh, two of my hockey mates, uh, Matt and Kevin. Hockey connection. I know. So random. Fantastic. <laughs> um, we played covers for a while, and then we uh, another one of my very good friends who helped me get into the music scene, David, uh, he moved to Taiwan, and he was having his wedding. So we prepared to play at his wedding. We played a gig in Taipei. I put my first ever gig in this uh, sort of Aboriginal uh, reggae bar um and then in played taiwan at his, at his wedding the next day yeah okay. so it was, it was very strange after that we came back to hong kong we started to write music but the problem with these guys is they were pilots who um, which which guys the people like, in like your band bandmates. yeah so oh, they were pilots okay. we, 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 we practice maybe you know once a month or twice in a month and then not for two months it was hard to, to get schedules together um so we never ended up having a gig as a band after Taipei, which was our biggest regret, really. Um, um, so when that ended, my friends, my, my two friends went back to Canada. 
Um, and then I was looking suddenly, yeah, needed to find more, more stuff to do. Um, so eventually one of my, my longtime friends decided he was playing guitar again. He'd been a drum bass DJ and he split up with a girlfriend and he got into his guitar. He's, you know, he's always been a guitarist. So he said, Hey, come and jam with us. So I went along feeling all sort of like, you know, I've been in a band before. This is going to be very easy. Um, and it was just uh, my friend, guitarist Riney, who's the lead guitarist of other theories. And then our original drummer, Keith, we we're in a practice room and I had no idea what melodies to sing or just found it incredibly hard to join in with this, uh, this jam. Oh, wow. So it, was, it was, it was a bit of a, bit of a shock really. Um, and, Part of that, in a, in a sense, was we were, they were playing essentially grunge rock, um, which I hadn't really necessarily touched upon um, before. And, and it took some time to start getting into that. So actually, I wasn't the original singer. We had another very experienced uh, singer called Phil from Germany. He'd been in many different bands before. Um, and then we had an even more experienced singer called Jordan, who's a Filipino star. Um, and when that sort of fell through, we weren't really going anywhere, weren't big enough for Jordan. Then I decided to take over. Um, yeah. And then haven't looked back since. And how was that? You know, when you said <laughs> that, I want to go back to that, what you said, interesting about you were kind yeah. of plopped in there. Right. And so you, you, how did that feel when you're, when people are just playing music and then you have troubles kind of getting in, but then you resolved that somehow and you guys are writing original songs. So how did you, figure that out you just like i'm just going to keep doing it until i get it right or how did, how did that journey work out for you yeah so i mean it was sort of doing different things with the guitar it was listening to a lot of music as well so i mean i remember very clearly getting the nirvana nevermind cassette when i was at mm -hmm. school um but there were other bands i'd never heard of who were massive so bands like stone temple pilots or Alice in Chains, so you know seminal grunge bands. So I, I I knew New Pearl Jam. That was one band I'd got into. Um, but I, so I listened to a lot of stuff, um, and then playing the first few gigs, performing, see, seeing sort of how it all came together, um, and then yeah, getting inspired. So initially writing lyrics and melodies, and then eventually getting into some guitar parts as well. Yeah. That's that's awesome. Sometimes it's not about the end goal, right? Sometimes it's about the process, right? If you're thinking about yeah. always, you know, this is this melody's got to be perfect, it's got to, you know, whatever it is. Sometimes you miss that opportunity to explore, you know, different genres of music or different artists and bands. I'd love to know if you could. Can you share the? I want to get into the aftermath. The aftermath. Yeah, you look <laughs> fabulous in that t-shirt. Oh, thank you. Thank you for, for sending this to me. <laughs> I was like, can I get a t-shirt? <laughs> yeah. And in Kyle, you actually delivered it to help me to deliver it, which is awesome. Um, can, tell me about the Aftermath. First of all, for those of you just joining us, uh, Kyle Haynes is a co-founder of the Aftermath, which is a very popular live music venue in one of the busiest districts central uh, in Hong Kong. And I love to know how did that even come to be? You kind of briefly, I think you may have briefly told me the story before, but can you tell us, like, was that very serendipitous and very random in a way? Tell us how that started. Um, I guess there was a few different factors. So, so one was uh, growing very tired of my job and really hating the sort of private teaching industry, the parents in Hong Kong. Pretty, pretty. Hey, insane. I'm a parent in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> what are you um, saying? <laughs> so yeah, so, some, some, of course, only some parents. Um, so really wanting to do something else. Thinking then, what did I want? I had no idea really what I wanted to do. So I gave my my company six months notice. Um, Without even having an end goal in mind, you're just like, yeah, this is. I know I'm meant to be here. Pick up the kind bar. of thing. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Say that again. Just to give myself this uh, this this sort of deadline, really, to get myself going, to, to think about different things, and Love ultimately, it. I didn't really find find that out. So I joined an international school as a teaching assistant to give myself just a more headspace and some sort of financial security. Um, I went to Canada during that summer break to meet my old bandmate Matt, um, one of my 
my best mates who I'm still writing music with him as well. We can talk about that later. Um, and then, yeah, I wasn't really sure exactly what to do. Um, and then my, one of my ex-colleagues, Alicia, who's the other co-founder of The Aftermath, um, I'd worked with her for three years teaching. Um, she started to put on, on gigs. So she formed this company called All That Junk, initially thinking about hiring junk boats and having parties on junk boats but then started to hire different venues around town and got bands to play. So naturally I was like, Hey, can I help you out? Um, can I you know, run tickets for you, sell drinks, whatever. Um, and that was, that was a lot of fun. So we, she did maybe four or five gigs, something like that. Um, and then she came to me one day and said, Hey, do you want to open a, a live music bar? Um, you know, as one does <laughs> over coffee. Hey, as one does, yeah. Do you want to open a live bar with me? <laughs> Was so, that I mean, the conversation? <laughs> it's something I, I don't understand. I thought about before. I'd been running through all these ideas in my head. What can I do? Do I open a music practice room? Do I try some sort of recording studio? Um, different, different things. And I thought about the venue. There was a place in uh, Sign Pun. Uh, Shekton Choi called uh, Beating Heart uh, Studio, which was in this industrial building that had good equipment, a stage there. The guy that ran it was, was you know, very familiar with, with sound production. Um, and I went there for a few gigs and it was amazing. So I thought in my mind, yeah, I can probably do something like this, um, find this space in an industrial building and, and replicate this somewhere else. And some of my friends were like, oh, that equipment, you know, it costs hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and so in my mind i sort of put that to the back and said i i need to get more capital to be able to do that it's an impossible sort of dream so when elisa said to me do you want to open a bar i said to her yes of course i'd love to but how do we actually make that possible how can we get the capital to do that um and she was instrumental in in pushing me to to see the idea is, is real and then she went and found a lot of investment um actually through a lot of friends and family as well so most of the investors we know very well um but yeah it was it was great to get that support from different people to to really pursue my my dream or a, a goal that i've had well that's that's the thing is i think you know there's a lot of great takeaways even from that story itself is you you never know who you're going to meet you know, you and you take opportunities that not necessarily knowing where that's going to lead to, right? One thing can lead to another, but then you're keeping yourself open minded. However, you did say something like you knew that you wanted to, you had a vision in you that you wanted to open a, 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 um, a live venue, and but you didn't know how, right? But then was that always within you? So when that opportunity came up, were you like, this is what I've been waiting for? Was it a no brainer? Or was there like, hesitation like i don't know if i can do this what was that experience um, like for you it was much closer to being a no-brainer i mean there was definitely mm. hesitation about whether it could be possible um but yeah i mean it's, it's again it's probably something that's always been in me i mean my one of my favorite movies is wayne's world um oh so I, I can't <laughs> think when i saw that but again sort of seeing that sort of culture um, love those movies, um, yeah. but this sense of creating something and, and having that driving passion um, in terms of music maybe came from that. So yeah, it was, it was yeah, something I jumped on really from the start um, and then it got Amazing. a bit trickier. I guess. <laughs> yeah, tell me, tell us about that. I know that you've had, you've had a lot of hurdles to jump up through. When was the, uh, when was the aftermath established? Was it 2018? It was the end of 2018. We were sort of finished with our construction, but not let yet sort of fully licensed. So we had some sort of private BYOB gigs where people could buy tickets to get in, but then bought their own drinks or whatever. Um, and we had a, a few months of that with Friday and Saturday gigs. Um, and it was great, yeah, inviting friends, bands that we'd seen around Hong Kong, bands that had played previously at Alicia's shows. Um, and seeing it sort of come to life. Um, and what was the with... first hurdle for you, for you, for you and all the co-founders, the biggest hurdle that you had to come across? I think I might know, but <laughs> maybe it's something I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we sort of opened fully in, in January 2019, and it was a sense of growing. We saw steady growth 
through that. Um, and naturally, there's this, there was this thought in my mind that when you open a business, you you always have this sort of slow growth initially, perhaps, and then you, you find your feet. Um, and yeah, fast forward a few months after a sort of slow summer when we found a lot of bands were out of Hong Kong and the, the F&B sort of sales generally dip in the summer. Um, the protests came to Hong Kong. Um, yeah. and Craziness. <laughs> it was, tight. we weren't, in a sense, we weren't affected so much. Um, I mean, my, one of my, the other very popular music venue in Hong Kong, the Wunch for, for original underground music, they were right in the thick of it in one chat. Yeah, I remember. Um, so, yeah, we had tear gas in one day because there was tear gas on the street outside, but generally around here, there wasn't so much um, of the immediate action. Um, but yeah, people felt unsafe to travel. Um, we had to cancel a few events. Um, and just the mood in the city dropped, right? Um, Absolutely. It, it, it changed, it swiveled. So it became uh, trickier. Um, and then soon after that, then then the COVID and the coronavirus and so right, right and after that, that big, out. right after the big, um, you know, the protests and all that thing, you finding your feet again, and then there's uh, COVID until now. So yeah. I, I, the, I want to ask, how, how has being a co-founder of the aftermath, how has that forced you to be even more? Do you, would you say that it has forced you to be creative in ways that you know expand in an expansive way? Definitely. Um, I mean, you talked earlier in your intro about survival, and I think naturally you have to be more creative. Um, and that's, that's how humanity solves all problems, really, is with Absolutely. creativity. Um, so, I mean, initially when we opened uh, the Aftermath, I thought it would be a live music venue, and we'd have bands on all the time. And we started doing different events, and then during the different restrictions we had to be even more creative with the events that we could do um so not having live music and then not having comedy we've had you know thousands of different things like what is the strangest most creative or odd thing that you've ever had you've ever hosted in your venue are you allowed to share one of the <laughs> best one of the my favorite sort of initial events we had is related to the wall behind me i've got this is my jtang oh, wall us. i've got the J my jtang wall okay I've got my jag stang here and then I've got this uh, mural on the other side, I'm getting distracted, uh, <laughs> which is painted by a guy called Jacob Tang, who's a tattoo artist. Um, so through my, my girlfriend had some tattoos from him. He's you know, keen to, to spread his sort of art. So we had a, a tattoo art fair. So we had six different tattoo artists who came and had a stool and could make bookings and discuss potential tattoos with new clients. And we had some live tattoos on the stage, very simple things being done through the event as well. So that was oh, a really awesome. cool event. Had a, sort of some of our regular clients come in just to, to, to have a look. You had these new clients coming in, but a really successful midweek event that really got us to see the potential of, of midweek stuff really is, is bringing in more audience. And, That's amazing. Yeah. What's, what's the bigger what's the bigger vision? Can we actually have a quick look? I know that you are in the venue right now. Can you give us a little tour of the inside? Uh, yeah, the little sure. Workspace? <laughs> I am doing some construction at the moment of new uh, barriers uh, between tables. But this is the stage here. This you see it? Yeah. I'll stand back. So this oh, is awesome. the, the stage. Um, and around here is the bar. Da, 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 da. I've got this wonderful mural. I love that. By Robin down here. Um, so yeah, lots of lots of. What's art. the capacity there? This was the original piece of art we had by oh, uh, Daryl here, um, and then coming through to the lounge over this side, where we typically have art exhibitions, but at the moment the walls are bare. The new exhibition oh, cool. launched on Friday. Um, yeah, well, the the capacity is sort of like 120, yeah. um, but with the two different sides, we don't always fill both sides necessarily. So right. we tend to have a working capacity more of 70, and then obviously during restrictions, it's been 
being changed uh, quite a, quite a lot of, every day it changes <laughs> it seems but okay so i before we wrap up here um what i want to know what is the bigger vision that you have for the aftermath i know you mentioned before that you started it out with a vision of like a live music venue then you've you've learned you've had to expand that create a yeah. vision expand to other things so do you have a new you and your co-founders have a bigger vision for what you see that the aftermath can uh, create in the future yeah, I mean, we'd like to get into much bigger outdoor events. We started to, to work on one with uh, PMQ uh, this year um, to, to, yeah, to do bigger stuff, to bring in international artists, um, artists that from different communities around the world, not necessarily the sort of big names from the UK or the US, but um, to really encourage then reciprocal relationships to get Hong Kong bands to be able to go to more countries around Asia, to really grow the scene. Um, I have also like to, to work more with music schools to get more kids having the chance to perform on stage and getting that experience. I've already seen a lot of that. Um, but yeah, becoming sort of an agency for different bands as well to get them uh, different gigs around town uh, to link them up with different venues. Um, I mean, Amazing. ultimately, we want to see the, the music scene grow it doesn't yes. have to be a city full of aftermaths, but we need <laughs> we need more venues. We need more things happening. We need more opportunities for people to be creative. We need more platforms for people to be creative, for sure. Finally, what can we do to support the aftermath? Can you tell us? Well, the the big thing, if you're in Central, come down and have a chat, have a drink. Uh, we have got different events on. Uh, following our Instagram is probably the best way to do that. Is, yeah, that's uh, in the check in the links in the there. box in the description. In the <laughs> um, and we've got some crowdfunding initiatives at the moment. You can buy our merchandise, like the wonderful t shirt that Crystal is modeling here. <laughs> um, there you go. <laughs> yeah. uh, we've got some takeaway uh, drinks that people can buy, some great wines. We've got some craft beer that can be taken in growlers. Um, stuff on Bandcap. We did a live album. Um, or you can just you know, follow our YouTube channel, watch some of the amazing performances that we've done here and sort of give us traffic in that way. Amazing. Yeah. Kyle, thank you so much for being here. And I wish you and all the co-founders all the best. Thank you for sharing your journey and your stories with us. And may there be plenty more music to come. Uh, and I will definitely, when the restrictions lift, as soon as I can, we will definitely be regular patrons at the Aftermath. Maybe so. <laughs> ah, now you're talking my language. <laughs> all right, to all my Singers Connect students, we're going to see you in just a moment for our bonus Zoom call with Kyle. So join us on the private Zoom link um, now, and I'll see you there. Now, if you love this session, be sure to connect with Kyle through Instagram. Support the aftermath. Music is such a powerful outlet, as you've seen here. We talked about this for sharing hope and positive energy as well. And let's be honest. The world needs more hope and positive positivity now more than ever. You will find all the links you need to support the aftermath in the description box where you're watching this video. Thank you all for tuning in, and I'll see you again next month for another live conversation about music, passion, and creativity. Thank you, Kyle, and we'll see you in our Zoom. Okay. <laughs>